Jeremiah chapter number 2, we'll begin reading in verse number 12. The Bible says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Is Israel's servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the children of Noph and Taphanes have broken the crown of thy head. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself, and that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way? And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? To drink the waters of Sehor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria? To drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us once again to assemble in the house of God. God, we thank you for the precious word of God. We thank you for your church. Lord, we're, we're so thankful that you loved the church and gave yourself for it. We're thankful for Calvary. Thankful that you shed your blood through the propitiation of our sins. God, we're thankful, Lord, that on a cool Wednesday night we can come into a place of haven and refuge, uh, find strength and sustenance for our soul. God, thank you for the good singing, the good testimonies. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Uh, God, I pray for the next few minutes you'd put a hedge about this place. Uh, I pray you'd bind the powers of hell. God, I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, I pray if there was anybody that came in with a stony heart, uh, God, I pray for the Holy Ghost of God to use the hammer of the Word of God to break... Uh, that hard heart. Uh, God, I pray you'd break the molds of our complacency. God, I pray that, Lord, uh, you'd speak, and God, we'd be swift to hear and swift to do what thus saith the Lord. Uh, God, I pray for a Holy Ghost conviction. Uh, I pray for revival. I pray that, God, you'd breathe on this place, and God, once again, you'd take up your boat in the midst of thy people. God, I pray that we would not take for granted uh, the privileges set before us as children of God. Uh, and oh, God, I pray you'd give us a burden for sinners. Uh, give us a burden, Lord, to see uh, people trust in Christ before it's everlasting too late. Uh, Father, I pray for Miss Crystal. You'd touch her, uh, Lord, and you'd uh, uh, help her fever to break. And God, I pray you'd help her. I pray for uh, Xander the same. I pray for the Vinings. I pray for Miss Kay. Uh, I pray for Miss Janet. I pray for others that are sick. Uh, God, you'd help them. Those that are providentially hindered, uh, God, you'd touch them and be with them. Uh, then, God, I pray, uh, Lord, for those that could have been here and chose not to be here. Uh, God, I pray that, Lord, in your wrath you'd remember mercy. Uh, and through cords of love, you draw them to the center of thy will. Uh, now, Father, use your servant tonight. Uh, Lord, I'm an unworthy vessel, but God, I pray that you'd use us to deliver that uh, which you spoke to our hearts. Uh, and God, I pray for that one that is struggling, uh, that one that needs strength, uh, that one that may be lost. Uh, God, I pray everybody would leave out uh, in the center of the will of God, getting the help they need. Uh, for being in the house of God. Help us this night, we pray, uh, for it's in the wonderful and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Uh, amen uh, and amen. In this chapter, uh, we find that God begins to indict Israel uh, for turning their back on Him and turning to idols. Uh, can I say tonight that uh, throughout the weight of the charges that are brought against Israel, uh, I'm starting to see those things uh, creep into modern Christianity today. Uh, 
Listen, uh, I don't want to make any mistakes. You that are here uh, that come on a, a faithful way basis, you know, uh, uh, we're old-fashioned, uh, old-time, uh, fundamental Bible-believing Baptists. Uh, Hey, uh, we haven't changed, hadn't backed up, and aren't going to back up. Uh, uh, the things of God are still true. Uh, he's still worth worshiping. Uh, he's still worth living a holy life for. Uh, he's still worth telling sinners far and wide uh, that he'll save them from their sin. Uh, uh, we don't apologize for where we stand. Uh, but can I say, uh, I'm looking around, uh, and churches that once stood to, uh, and told the line for the truth uh, have allowed uh, the will of the world to sweep into their churches. Uh, can I say uh, it didn't start at the church house. Uh, it started at their house uh, and they brought it in uh, and they didn't have anybody rebuke it uh, and it's uh, uh, taking hold throughout our land uh, and modern Christian and Christianity has fallen just prey to the same thing that Israel did. Make no mistakes, uh, 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 Jeremiah the prophet is going to preach for the next uh, 20 something years uh, on their wickedness uh, and they need to turn unto God uh, uh, can I say this was God's chosen people uh, and they're still God's chosen people uh, we ought to pray for Israel tonight uh, but I'm thankful uh, he came unto his own and his own received him not uh, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the uh, sons of God even to them that believe on his name uh, Aren't you glad he made a way uh, for old Gentile dogs, old sinners, uh, uh, to be saved? And he grafted in the true vine of Israel a branch. Uh, and through the church we found a refuge. What a blessing. Uh, but I want to look at this text. Uh, we'll get to the thought. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But there's some things in here that I'm seeing even in God's people. Notice, if you will, the forsaking. Look, if you will, in verse number 13, the Bible says, uh, For my people have committed two evils. they forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Can I help you with something tonight? What would ever possess somebody that has had the blessings of God and the presence of God in their midst to ever forsake Him? Amen. Why would anybody want to forsake the fountain of living waters for a drink of muddy water? Right. Mm. Can I say Israel did it? But can I say uh, there are people that have known the grace of God, uh, that have had their sins washed away, uh, that have tasted of that fountain that Jesus told the woman at the well about in John chapter number 4, uh, uh, that have uh, uh, sat in fundamental churches, heard the truth preached to them, uh, and tonight uh, they have their uh, affection somewhere else. Uh, uh, tonight uh, with their lips they do honor God, but their heart is full far from him there are folks that are forsaking God brother Ron how come they don't forsake their job how come they don't forsake their family how come they don't forsake the pleasures of this world why would you put God on the back burner do you realize your very breath is in his hand do you realize he knows you're down sitting at the uprising he knows the number of the hairs on your head why would we ever turn Turn our backs on Almighty God uh, who is still well able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Uh, hey, listen, I wouldn't turn my back on God. Uh, yet many are. They're forsaking God. I've said it often. If we just had everybody that used to come to church we'd have to have a sanctuary five times this size. Yep. Amen. Say, what happened? They started, right? What happened to them? They just chose the far country yeah. Amen. rather than the Father's house. We see the forsaking. Hmm? Notice, if you will, the forging. Look what it said again in First. 13, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They chose not to hold to the law of God. They chose not to fear God. They chose 
to hew them out their own cisterns, they could not hold water. Hmm? You would not believe the excuses I've heard over the years why people quit on God. You would not believe what people will do today and they're satisfied with it. We live in a day and age where we deal with things called recovering fundamentalists, where people apologize for the old-time way and the way they was raised. And they have hewed them out cisterns. They start with changing the Bible. Then they start. Uh, uh, they continue on with changing the truths of the Bible and the doctrines uh, 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 of the Bible, and they, they hear their own doctrines. They hear their own standards. They hear their own uh, uh, desires, uh, and they expect God to be pleased with it. Can I help you with something? Uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He has not changed His mind about sin. Uh, if it was sin in the beginning, it's still sin today, uh, and it doesn't matter. Uh, you can put lipstick on a pig. You can fly it up all you want to. You can pretty it up all you want to. Uh, hey, but if it doesn't come from that book and it doesn't honor the Lord, God isn't in it. Uh, Amen. They always have a justification. Well, we want to reach more lost people. Well, they can get out and knock on doors. Well, we, we, uh, we want to re reach the young people. Well, preach to them. Don't bring in fog machines and rock bands and all that. If it looks like the world, it's of the world. Uh, right. They forge them out their own cisterns. And can I say, many churches that once preached the truth don't even resemble a church today because they're Amen. doing it their way. Amen. We see the forsaking. We see the forging. Now think about their forging. They hewed them out. That took half her There's been a lot of effort into building their own way. It brought exhaustion. They hewed them out of cistern. Got wore out. You know what I, I've heard about places like up on the corner and everything? They go through their congregation. They turn it over about every 8 to 16 months. Because if you don't have something driven by the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, it, it will not sustain you. Amen. And then it leaves them just like that cistern, empty. Yeah. Do you ever see that crowd come out of there? They're empty. They go in there and they do everything they're, they're told to do and they, they enjoy their rock band. They jump up and down and when, when, when to wash and all that stuff but they have nothing inside them from God Amen. God help us the Bible says be ye filled with the Holy Ghost Amen. Well, they can't be filled with it because they don't have him Amen. and what they have don't hold him can I say this? A Christianity built on works and rules never brings the joy and peace that the one based on worship and a relationship with God does. Amen. Thanks be unto God. We've been adopted into His family, have the adoption of sonship, and we can truly worship Him in spirit and in truth. What a blessing. Hmm? Can I say this? On my lowest day, I'm still saved and rejoicing in the goodness of God. Hmm? I appreciate our preachers. Had several reach out to me. You know, words got out. My blood pressure has been a little high. Then I come in, Brother Ray cranked up the heat. It got real high there for a minute. I appreciate the preachers that we have. And at a moment's notice, any of them could have stood and supplied the pulpit tonight. but I'm still kicking. Uh, and God's been so good to me, as long as I've got breath, I still want to kick. Hmm? I watched my granddaddy in a hospital bed do more preaching than some guys have ever done because he still had breath. Hey, let me move on. We see the forsaking, the forging. Notice the fearful in verse 15. 
the young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste, and the cities are burned without inhabitants. He's referring to the, in, the enemies and the armies that came and started destroying the cities of Israel, started burning the cities of Israel. But notice the wording that God chose to pin down. He said, The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. Uh, uh, we're uh, familiar with 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, can I say something? Uh, uh, he uses the word roaring. Uh, the young lions roared. Uh, can I say uh, roar is a deafening sound? Uh, and the devil roars a lot uh, in order to deafen you to the word of God. Uh, he wants to put a sound in your ear that causes you to listen to him instead of listening uh, to that still small voice within you. Uh, instead of listening to what thus saith the Lord. Uh, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God uh, and if the devil can divide you from the scriptures uh, won't be long he'll divide you from the Savior uh, and he'll uh, pounce on you uh, and he'll have his way with you uh, the Bible said whosoever breaketh the heads the serpent biteth uh, he wants to get you away from the Savior uh, so he can uh, uh, have his way in your life uh, but we also find uh, uh, that it mentions a yell uh, a yell is a piercing sound Sound. Uh, can I say it's one thing uh, for the devil to roar uh, and you recognize that roar and you run back to the Savior. Uh, the Bible does say draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Uh, it's one thing uh, uh, when you hear a roar. Uh, it's another thing when you get wounded with a piercing sound, uh, a screech, uh, a shriek, uh, uh, something uh, uh, that will absolutely wound you. Uh, uh, listen, uh, my dear friends, I say it often. Uh, we as an individual are no match for the devil. Uh, outside the protecting hand of God, we'd all be in a mess. Uh, I'm glad I'm in Jesus' hand. Uh, his hand's in the Father's hand. Uh, and no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Uh, and nothing can ever come to me uh, that doesn't go through God's hand. Uh, but God allows sometimes uh, for the heads to be dropped a little bit uh, in order for us uh, uh, to see really what we're made of uh, but even though we're no match for the devil uh, he's no match for the master uh, and aren't you glad the gates of hell uh, shall not prevail against the church of the living God uh, hey uh, you don't have to live in a barren land uh, you don't have to live in a wasteful land uh, you've got the church uh, you've got an oasis uh, you've got a place uh, where God uh, is always fruitful uh, you got a place where the devil, uh, he hates. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, but we see the fearful. There are so many of God's people walking around in fear. Well, what about that verse, Thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. Where's the victory? Right. You know why folks don't have the victory, Brother Tony? They're too busy listening to the devil. Amen. Uh, you get to listening to God. You get to looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You get to walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, uh, spending time with Jesus, uh, be about the Father's business. Guess what? You won't be fearful. Right. Hmm. There are a lot of people so afraid. They don't have to be afraid. They need to learn to rest in Jesus. Therefore, or it, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, Hebrews 4, 9. That rest is found in Jesus. If you can ever learn to just lean on His bosom like John did, you get to where you hear the heartbeat of God, you won't fear anything the devil says to you. Amen. Then notice, if you will, the fallen. Uh, look with me in verse number 16. Also the children of Noph and Tahaphanes have broken the crown of thy head. Uh, can I say, uh, Noph was a city. It's also known in those days as Memphis. We would know it today as Cairo. Cairo said that Noph, the children of Noph and Tahaphanes have broken the crown of thy head. 
Tahafanes uh, was named after an Egyptian goddess named Tefnet. And broken the crown of thy head means that they'd come in and they had uh, slain Josiah the king. Could I say that these are Egyptian cities. Egypt's always a picture of the world. And if you're not careful, you let the world have its way in you and you'll find out the most precious things you have are broken. And I got to thinking about what does those names of those cities mean? What do they represent? Well, Noph meant the abode or the haven of good men. Can I say one of the tools of the devil? He'll get you pointing to a false church, a false religion, and say, well, they're doing good works. They're good people. There's good people there. Even though the Bible says there's none that do it good, no, not one. We realize anything we do that accomplishes anything is that Jesus did it through us. Amen. We're His workmanship. Amen. Uh, but they'll always point to what good works they are. I'll never forget this outfit up the corner years ago. They would, on hot days, they'd stand out there and pass out water to people driving by at the stop sign. And say, well, they was doing a good work. Well, that's not going to get them to heaven. Right. <coughs> People are always point to good works. By the way, some of these very same feel-good churches are some of the uh, most anti-God churches going. When you got men cracking open beers on the stage and say Jesus would have a beer with them. Uh, when you have a man uh, here and come to Cincinnati from California, the porn church, and stand up and say porn is all right. Let me help you something. Porn is never all right. Porn caters to the flesh. Porn is wicked. Most of the people that participate in those films have been drug-induced. And they come to testify years later how wicked and how mistreated they were. Can I say, it's all glorifies the flesh and it's wicked and it will take your mind away from the things of God. Amen. Brother Jim told me one here. The Methodist church was boasting here. United Methodist Church was just boasting here in the last few weeks, come and have a beer with a queer. Oh, they embrace all that pride stuff. God resisted the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, they're called churches. And when they stand and say, we serve the same God, no, we do not. And when Jesus comes in John uh, in Revelation 19, literally back to His second coming of this earth, when we come back with Him on them white horses, uh, He's coming back in the fierce and wrath and indignation of Almighty God. Uh, he's come to judge that crowd, my dear friends. Listen. Verse 17, we find where the fault lied. He said, Hast thou not procured this unto thyself? That word procured means secured. They secured judgment unto themselves. Can I say what's wrong in most of our churches today is we don't want to admit guilt. Amen. We don't invite the Holy Ghost to come and convict folks of sin anymore. We don't preach on sin anymore. And as a result, people get the idea... Well, I can live how I want to and be all right. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It'd be a great day in our churches when we start becoming accountable. Amen. And we say, Lord, revival hasn't come because of me. Lord, I haven't prayed for it. I haven't sought for it. I haven't live like I, I should live. And I got to thinking about all this, got to reading all this this week, got to looking at all this stuff. I got to thinking about churches that live far beneath their privileges. This is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on just for a couple minutes. I want to preach on why settle. Why settle for what they got? Why settle for not having revival? Why settle for not having a victorious life? Why settle for not having all the blessings God has? 
He said, prove me now in Malachi 3. If I won't open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing you cannot contain. I watched everybody walked in. It looked like y'all could contain some more blessing. Yes. Why settle for coasting when we could bask in the glory of our darling Savior? I got to think about a couple things. First of all, why settle for a life of mediocrity? Yeah. Why settle for a life that's just commonplace? Oh, yeah. hmm? When you was growing up, did you ever set your bar for, you know, you remember how teachers used to teach, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And kids would say a fireman or a policeman or an astronaut or a doctor or a lawyer. Did you ever say, well, I just want to be... Regular. I don't want anything extreme. I don't want anything too good. You know, I want to have the medium-looking house on, on the block. Well, I settle for that. We walk our, our, our dog in our neighborhood. There's part of our neighborhood. I'm, glad, I'm proud to live there. Then there's other part of the neighborhood. Looks like Herman Munster lives there. You know what I'm saying? Huh? I really, I mean, it's one house. It's scary. I think there's corpses inside. I'm not kidding you. It's a scary place. I'm expecting Uncle Fester to walk out any time. I mean, it's scary. We don't walk past it. We kind of stroll real quickly past that house. You know what I'm saying? And the house right next to it used to look just as bad. And they come in, they slap some paint on it. And I thought, man, they're cleaning this place up and everything. They put it up for sale for $360,000, $360,000. And they didn't do one thing on the inside. We looked it up and said, oh, man, they must have made this place. $360,000. i am thinking, people are stupid. $360,000. And you're living next to the monsters. Shh. Huh? Why settle for mediocrity? Amen. Why settle for just being right there at the bar? Right. Uh. My in-law's pastor, he, I've, I've, I've been at several weddings, and he always says this. He said, he always says, I've never seen an ugly bride. I've seen a few just come in right over the scale, but I've never seen an ugly one. You know what I'm saying? Why just settle for that? Why settle for just coming to church? Why don't we have church? Right. Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't even got to preach yeah. tonight. You should have come in and say, boy, the Lord's been good to me. Uh, He's blessed my life. He saved me. Uh, 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 he's uh, met every need. Uh, uh, boy, He's uh, helped me this week from the Scriptures. Uh, 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 he just put a song in my heart, a spring in my step. Uh, God's been good. I have no complaints. Uh, even if you've had a bad week, uh, it could have been a whole lot worse. You're not in a nursing home tonight. Uh, uh, you don't live down there where the flood took your house away. Uh, I, I mean, God's been good to you. You could have at least said, you know what, I've had a bad week. Uh, really? haven't been all, all I should be uh, but he's been everything he said he would be I mean everybody could have come in and had something to say tonight but we're comfortable with a life of mediocrity hmm. why settle for that huh I thought about this why settle for a life that's mundane you know what a mundane the life is you have no goal or no vision hmm no vision. The Bible says where there is no vision, people perish. You ought to have some goals and visions in your Christian life. You ought to strive to be a better Christian than you were last month. And you ought to strive to be a, a, a better husband, a better wife, a better child, a, a better parent. Uh, you ought to have some goals. Uh, uh, you ought to uh, uh, strive to uh, uh, get out of debt if you're in debt. And you ought to strive uh, uh, to give more to missions and give more to the house of God. And you ought to strive uh, uh, to just do more than what you're doing. Amen. You just got a mundane life. When was the last time you prayed, Lord, help me give more to missions? Right. Good. Amen. Lord, help me get more involved at church. Amen. Lord, help my prayer life to increase. Amen. I told this years ago, it's a true story. I picked up the autobiography of Pray and Hide. And, uh, I mean, Jordan was a baby. And, uh, I picked that book up, and, and I was sitting there reading it, and I just threw it down. My wife said, what, what's wrong with you? Miss I said, what's wrong with you? I said, that book's what's wrong with me. I got to reading how much that guy prayed and how he prayed and, 
And then he prayed so much that his heart was actually dislodging and moving in his chest. And they said, you keep praying like that, you're going to die. And he said, don't threaten me with heaven. Uh, and I mean, that fellow, he prayed. Uh, and I thought, man, I've never prayed. Stuff like that ought to inspire us to pray more. Seek God more. Amen. Heard stories about old men that have a little shed out back where they go out and pray, had a little bench, go pray. And then when they pass away, people go in that shed and see where the, uh, the floor was uh, uh, bowed out where his knees was because he prayed so much that it wore the floor out. We ought to have a goal to pray more. We ought to have a goal to read our Bible more. We ought to have a goal. Uh, ought to be a blessing to somebody. But most of our lives are mundane. Here's, here's, here's how I can sum up most lives, Brother Clint. They get up, go to work, come home, eat, eat dinner, watch a little TV, go to bed, get up, do it over, do it over. Went to church time, get up, come to church, sit down, listen to me, rant and rave, and get up, go home, come back. And, get, and there's never any change. Right? Just mundane. Hmm? Why settle for that? You don't have to be mundane. Amen. You can have joy. Yes. You can actually smile. Mm -hmm. yeah. huh? You know, they say it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Yeah. Huh? You know what I found? If I smile hard enough, I lose some of my double chins. <laughs> Need to smile more, Dr. Phil. Why settle for that? Why settle for a life that is meaningless? A life that is empty. That's what a hewed out cistern is, empty. Amen. We ought to do inventory on our lives and see if we're doing anything for the cause of Christ. You ought to strive to make a count. I remember when we had Brother Neil here back in March for uh, 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 the soul winning conference and he just challenged us for everybody to win one. I was thinking about this this week. I wonder how many people are still taking that serious. Just win one. And by winning them, I mean not only getting them saved, but getting them into the house of God and disciple them and, and teach them the things of God so they can go out and win somebody. Have a life that counts. Hmm? Sid's sitting there, and her freshman year college, she played on a pretty good basketball team. Uh, they went to March Madness and the whole deal. They won the conference championship. She got a ring, the whole deal. But Sid would fight to get 20 seconds in a game. I mean, around here, Sid was the only girl in northern Kentucky that was all region in two sports. By the time she got to college, everybody there was all region. They all came from winning programs. And she was fighting and fighting. We'd go to games just hoping she'd get in. I, I remember Brother Clint, there were some games she'd get in six seconds. She worked hard all week long. She ran as much as the other girls. She lifted as much as the other girls. She did the water aerobics like the other girls. She worked in practice like the other girls to get six seconds. But when they won the championship, they played against a very, very good team. Had some very, very good guards. And our guard play was exceptional that night and shut their guards down, and that's what caused us to win. And when it was all said and done, the coach honored her because she worked so hard in practice, she pushed the starters to work harder. And because of her effort, they were able to, play, able to play that good against those other guards. And even though she only got a, a, a couple minutes throughout the whole tournament, she still got a ring. Amen. What I'm saying is you don't have to be the one behind the on the platform or the one behind the pulpit to make your life account for Christ. Amen. 
you can do things that nobody even ever sees. Get up a little earlier and touch heaven and grab a hold of the hordes of the altar uh, and move heaven toward earth. Uh, you can live a life that is meaningful. You can make a difference. Uh, you can count for Christ. Uh, you don't have to be called to preach. You don't have to be a, t a Sunday school teacher. You don't have to be a deacon or a trustee. Uh, but you can make your life count for Christ. Uh, you can make an impact. You can make a difference. Uh, you can check on folks when they're sick. You can and pray for folks. Uh, you can reach out and be friendly to somebody. Uh, you can touch a life of a neighbor. You can have a life that is meaningless. Why settle for one that's not? Amen. Thought about this. Why settle for a life of misery? Christians ought to never be miserable. We ought to be having the time of our life. You know, they call us the no fun denomination, the Baptists. I'm having a great time. Leave me alone, huh? Amen. Uh, oh, we don't live a wicked life. Well, we have a good life. The best life you can ever live is the life of a Christian. But why be miserable? Can I say misery? And remember that verse 17? Why hast thou procured this unto thyself? You're not miserable because of those around you. You're miserable because you're not where you should be with Christ. Amen. Why live that way? Amen. Hmm? And I thought about this. Why settle for a life of just going through the motions? Amen. You know, we got the good Baptist handshake down. We got the smile down. Why live a life where you're just going through the motions? Yeah. Amen. Huh? It doesn't Jesus mean more to you than that? Amen, now listen. The only way we're going to see our lives different, our church different, our community different, our country different, is through true revival. And the only way we'll have revival, and by the way, we've got a, a meeting scheduled, but neither one of these preachers are bringing revival with them. They're great men of God, but they're not bringing revival with them. And we can't wait for the church to be revived because the church is made up of baptized believers. The only one you can be responsible for is you. That verse again. So you ought to make up your mind. I'm going to get everything God's got for me. And if God barks up my tree and tells me I need to do something or need to move up, you need to get right, I'm going to do it. Because I want everything God's got for me. And listen. We must have a conscious effort to change. Nobody likes change, and that's why our country's in shape it's in, why church is in shape it's in. You've got to have a conscientious effort. I'm going to change. I'm going to do what God says. In other words, I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn from where I'm at to Him. Amen. Then we've got to have uh, 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 put our confidence in Christ. We've got to rely on Him. He expects us to do what we can do, then He does for us what we can't do for ourselves. I'm just going to trust Jesus handle that stuff I can't handle. Amen. Hmm? Then we've got to commit not to go back. We've got to relinquish the reins of our life and not go back to where we were. Amen. Hmm? And then we've got to confirm our action by having a reactionary life. There ought to be fruit in our life. Works meet under repentance. If we don't, then just like Israel, we'll pay the cross for remaining the same. God help us not to settle, not to remain the same. God help us to truly, and this is settled all, fall in love with Jesus all over again. If we'd love Him right, everything else take care of itself. Huh? Miss Annette never has to worry about me coming home at night because I love her with all my being because I believe God made her for me. Nobody else put up with me. Huh? I go to a meeting. She knows I'm coming home. No place like home. I'm trying to help you tonight. You ought to love Jesus so much that he never questions your loyalty. You ought to love Him so much that you can't live a mundane life. You and Jesus ought to be better than any Hallmark movie. Let 
Let me help you something. He's done his part. Amen. Or we will do our part. Why settle for anything less than being all he'd have you to be? God help us to truly be Christ-like in this wicked day. I still believe the Lord is well able to send revival. I still believe he's well able to save. I still believe he wants to do great things. He's just waiting for some folks that want him to do great things. If we put as much confidence in the Lord as we do Trump, oh my stars, what would happen in America? God help us to sell out for the cause of Christ. Let's all stand, Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Whether they're coming and picking out a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. God help us not to settle. Help us not to end up like Israel. Help us, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory and not end up like many churches turning our backs on the things of God. But God, help us not to be pious and throwing stones at them, only to realize, Lord, if we're not careful, we'll end up in the same shape. God, I pray for those that have turned away from you that they'd come back to you. I pray for churches that have embraced the ways of the world. They'd repent and get right and truly become a church again. God, send great revival these days. May it start with us. May it start with me. God, help us not to settle for anything less than all that you have for us. Help us to give our best because you gave your best. Speak to hearts now. Have your way in this invitation. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.